Hi guys, this is Second Perspective. My name's Paul Weston. And one I'm of them Mitchell is... Allen. There yeah, no, I'm Mitchell Allen. I'm here. <laughs> and Kevin Hatch. All right, Mitch, why don't you just start us on the topic that we're going to hit on? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I think something that really interested all three of us um, about... Okay, so what, what, what film is this? The film is Watchmen from 2009. Watch. <laughs> oh my God, you guys are already here. All right, so <laughs> so no, we uh, we thought um, the most interesting, uh, at least the stuff that we really connected on in terms of talking about this, is uh, just how ambiguous the I don't want to say message because I don't think every movie needs a message per se, but the statement or intent of this movie is. Well, okay. Um, no. I let, let me reframe that. I don't know if it's necessarily the intent of the film, but the intent of the director. Sure. That's, I think we should yeah. clarify that. Because... I think you're, yeah, you're exactly right. Mm. That's true. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I don't think, uh, I have to look this up, but I don't think Snyder wrote the film. No. But it was he... David Hader and... And uh, Alex Z. Oh, Alex Z. Yes. I remember that I saw the credits yeah. when I watched it last night. But... Um, but you can sort of tell that there is there is a mission that he's on in the movie, um, and he's is adapting it really faithfully. But then he does they do end up changing the ending in a slight way from the graphic version, and there's ways that they abbreviate things, and the structure is a little bit different. So it's not like he's done zero work in bringing this to the screen. But having said that, there's a lot that sort of feels like it may be impactful merely because of adaptation and not necessarily because of a director putting his personal stamp on it. I don't know. Does anyone more have like thoughts on it just to begin or? Well, like my, my issue with it essentially is that I, at the end, and it's, it's something that Mitch sent to me after he had watched the film. It was like, is, is Zack Snyder like, like glorifying certain things or is he just depicting it and it becomes very difficult to make that differentiation on this stuff especially with things like uh violence because like it looks fucking cool right and 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 yes. there's very few if any moments where a character stops to think about um you know holy crap this is really nasty or a character goes so far that it's very obvious that um the, like the, there, the, yeah, the, the, the I, I see what you're saying. Being condemned, it's like you know that's yeah. why you know we don't know if this is the best thing the character should be doing. The only brief moment I can think it might do this is when, um, holy crap! Uh, oh no! We're talking about R Rorschach. Rorschach, thank you. Yeah. Almost, I, I'm gonna... <laughs> thank God we had a discussion before. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> Paul Rorschach. <Shark. laughs> Mr. R, no, um, I'm sure somebody's gonna just burn me for that. But anyways, <laughs> when he's hacking somebody in the head. Yeah. With the with uh, uh, the butcher's meat cleaver, knife, yeah, the meat cleaver. It's it's for a brief moment it hangs, and you kind of like you can tell there's something right. more there than just hey look it's kind of neat, right? And so, yeah. I noticed too. The other one that really stuck out for me in terms of almost unnecessarily graphic choreography was when uh, Night Owl and Silk Spectre are mugged in an alley, walking over mm. to the former Night Owl's place, yeah. and there that's sort of like not top skinheads whatever mm -hmm. pseudo 1980s gang that's supposed to be sure. and in defending themselves and this is supposed to be a big valorizing moment for the two of them they're doing things like thrusting knives into people's necks mm -hmm. and bursting arms so that you see the bone from the arm jutting way out of the skin it's mm -hmm. really grotesque so right. that to me was when it started pushing the level from oh this is kind of cool and mm -hmm. fun and splashy and slow-mo and going into the really grotesque intense violence there which was pretty unsettling well the, the interesting yeah sorry the interesting thing i remember from that scene uh and by the way so uh full disclosure i've read the graphic novel and kevin you've yes you've i have read it, right yeah okay yeah. so and i and i don't need no books i don't know how to read <laughs> all right so we'll just we, yeah we'll we'll, 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 we'll we'll just talk to paul later it's fine um <laughs> but um but in that scene i don't remember them being so like joyful about busting, you know, 20 people or whatever it is. I, I sort of remember they're, like, caught off guard, and then they have to do what they got to do because they're, you know, that's who they are, right? But Yeah, and it's exactly, think, it, yeah. But, it's especially disturbing, too, because this is supposed to be a big moment for them in that it's kind of like a, 
uh, recalling old times where they go, oh, this is like the good old days where we were superheroes and we saved the day and we stopped crime and busted thugs and stuff. And it, it's it's insanely violent. Yeah, and it's it... way excessive, and it raises a disturbing thought of like, if this was the good old days, it really drives it into interesting perspective as to why superheroes are being banned here in this mm. proto 80s society. Yeah, and like that's the that's the thing too. And like maybe it's just not in the original content, but it doesn't sort of focus on that too much. I mean with the comedian you kinda of tell, but it's just because he's a complete dick. And like, okay, sure. But then you know, like if he's just a bad guy, then like, you know, deal with him. But like they're saying they ban all superheroes and it doesn't really focus on that too much. And it doesn't and like maybe the, as again, the original content doesn't, but I feel like with these are avenues that could have allowed Zack Snyder a moment sort of like with without using words to say something or to leave us with thoughts and to be like Having know, having having said that, I think the one Way, the one um, avenue where he does start doing stuff like that, and and you made note of um, mm. the psychoval scene where Rorschach is flashing back to this this guy who's murdered a child, and then mm. he kills him with a meat cleaver. Right. But it, the way that they use Rorschach in general, and I think this speaks for both the film and the novel, is uh, pretty smart because you're getting subtle exposition as to like what's actually happening in the world, but you're also getting a mindset of not just you know, someone who was deeply disturbed, like him personally, but I think kind of a societal, you know, insight into, well, I think everyone's just sort of given up and we're just waiting for the doomsday clock to get to, you know, to zero. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I think uh, the, the kind of jittery narration and joke telling and half storytelling that Rorschach does in the narration and sort of that pulp, like detective, like narration, I think is, the only way that uh, we can see any sort of like ambiguity or, um, you know, nihilist viewpoint. And I stress the viewpoint part because I think that's what this film sort of misses uh, dearly from from the text anyway, is that it doesn't really choose something. Sure. Absolutely. And you really get the sense too with a lot of the characters, and this was represented in the graphic novel as well, is just how conservative a lot of the characters are meant to be. It's this very, very old-fashioned mindset which recalls this kind of frontier justice and the vigilante violence being motivated by the idea that every one of them views that their view is entirely right Mm. above all else, which I think the screenplay challenges a little bit by having so many butting heads viewpoints of morality that by the end of the film, as we mentioned earlier, it's not entirely clear if anyone is right or it, which one is the best fit for these troubled times? Mm. Do you think? Do you think it condones impulse over logic, or because on on one hand you have Rorschach actually solving the case just by you know doing whatever the hell he wants and breaking then, arms, and, but then Manhattan yeah. leaves and he's like you know he he's basically says like it's it's irrelevant, humanity is irrelevant. But then it ends up that Rorschach sort of doesn't do much by the end. And then uh, Manhattan does show up sort of in the nick of time to do something. So well, like, uh, do you see what, I, do you I see what I'm confused here? I think <laughs> yeah. the, the thing that's causing issue for us, or at least for me, is that if like we're saying he does or does not, like if he does not condone, it's like a blue color. If he does right. condone, it's right. red. It's just like blue, red, blue, blue, red, 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 yeah, blue, red, right. blue. And yeah. it's just, it's, there's things that contradict each other. And so we can basically conform, like we can create almost any argument and probably sort of right. But essentially, like I feel like this sort of red, blue, red, blue thing just all of it cancels out. And it just creates this thing where it's just whatever the director does, it seems sort of by accident. You know what yeah. I mean? Absolutely. And I think he, again, I really get the sense that the film that he is trying, his own personal values are very different than that of the graphic novel, which he's trying so hard to adhere to. Mm -hmm. So you get a little bit of tension between this very, very harsh nihilistic critique of the superhero narrative and a guy who's really excited to do flourishing action choreography scenes and really wants to make a superhero film. Like a a film like uh, Kick-Ass, it's very clear what it's doing for me 
Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's it's so abundantly clear. It's sort of making fun of them. It's doing the hyper violence. It's also kind of making fun of that. But it's also saying like, and ultimately there is a little bit of something to be, you know, to think about. And like, you know, there are certain ramifications to all this. With Watchmen, it, part of it's like, look at this. This is totally neat. And then like, there are brief moments where it's like, oh, but it's super bad. Or like, these people are bad. But then like, the next scene, it's just like this amazing, cool action sequence and it's just sort of like there's a there's a there's a quote by brad bird um and i can't remember if this was an interview that he gave or perhaps something he said out of context but uh he said if you're directing a film um the worst thing that you can do is make every scene your best scene because mm-hmm. there's no lead up to your great stuff and there have to be a couple scenes that are just good you know they're just good and they do what they have to do and they're fine sure. but it, but it, i noticed when i'm watching this and I, I haven't watched this in a long time but every shot in this movie has at least like one trick to it so there's like a giant cgi like field back there or they're like yeah. pushing out of something or they're like turning around a corner in a weird dolly move like there's always something that he's pushing and you know i you know comes to him for like trying so hard but you feel like there's just too much effort put into everything and it all sort of like washes a little bit by the end. When everything right. is great, nothing is great. <laughs> oh, well, this in- is and this is the Incredibles. That's that's <laughs> that. Brad Bird, Brad Bird, guys. Yeah. There you go. He also likes superheroes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is there's definitely an overstimulating quality to it, and I think with that is part of the problem is the novel. The the very means that you read a novel, you can read it in a more episodic fashion where you can mm. stop and contemplate, but. By doing it, by cramming it all into a film that at two hours and forty minutes still feels, compared to the graphic novel, like it's leaving a lot out. It it is a bombardment of a ton of different ideas and concepts and characters and viewpoints, and it's a lot to take in. And I think any director at working at their peak capacity would struggle to do full justice to it. Did you feel like the music contributed to this as well? I just wanted way? to ask you, yeah, because. I, I don't notice music too often. Um, it's just more like a feeling, whatever, at the end. But I, I, I definitely know when they use, like, Hello Darkness, like... Uh, yeah, so I Silence. Yeah. And, then, and then it used um, Hallelujah when they're having sex or something. And that's just... a legendarily weird decision right there. <laughs> but I, but I, I, actually, I actually think that's one of the better decisions in the movie. Really? I, I, I like do. You to... so, so let me explain. So I... I watched uh, this movie this time, and I, I remember vividly the mo- stuff I remember the most is um, Rorschach and Manhattan storyline, I think, is the one they keep the most faithful, and it's also, I think, the most emotionally compelling. Absolutely. But the, what, the, the two characters that I found most interesting, even if it wasn't the best performances, even if it didn't totally strike the balance, but um, in, in the graphic novel Silk Spectre and Night Owl... Um, they do end up together. They do end up having this romantic chemistry, but they're both a little more, um, I guess, complex or a little more moody uh, or pessimistic in some ways. But in this film, they sort of seem like this happy-go-lucky superhero couple, and they're always doing the right thing, and they're always in the right spot. And they're, you know, at one point, they're like literally saving a building full of like burning people like and orphans or some shit. Yeah, and the one the little world. boy actually says, "Mommy, is that Jesus?" <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. They're really pushing like these nice, nice people, and then their next response is just automatically get turned on by the fact that they had the power to do something good and just, you know, bone to hallelujah, which if you've ever listened to Leonard Cohen's hallelujah is a really creepy, very like overtly bizarre, Super sexy jam. Come on. Yeah. It's not really, it's very, <laughs> very disturbing. And I think what he's trying to do with this is he, he's sort of critiquing, um, you know, alongside with Rorschach just being nihilist and kind of going nuts. But I think he's saying, you know, if you're being a hero, why is it that you're being a hero? Is it for helping the general good or is it for personal gratification? And isn't there a sort of sickness in there? And I think the film's able to sort of elucidate on that with the music choice and with the way that they sort of frame these characters as super corny until that one, you know, very lurid, kind of messed up scene i don't know if that okay. was what i got my, okay my my thought on that is can you give me another example or two where he hits on that theme point because if you can't then i just think he lucked into it 
Well, earlier in the film, there's the idea that Night Owl literally can't get it up until yeah. he's wearing a superhero costume, and that's how he valorizes his masculinity. That's mm -hmm. where he has his self sense of self-identity. Same as Rorschach, when he takes off his mask, he calls it his face, and he says that his being, his secret identity, so to speak, is his, is his false face, whereas him wearing the Rorschach mask is his real face. I think Night Owl parallels that exactly, and that's possibly why they got along as a sort of crime-fighting partnership there. He yeah. doesn't really have much of a personal identity as Dan Dryberg at all. It's only when he puts on the, the owl mask and the whole costume that he has any sense of himself as a person, as a man, as anyone of worth, really. What is, uh, his, what is his superpower supposed to be? Or like so, his... so, here's, so here's the trick to Watchmen, is that only one of them really has a superpower. Mm -hmm. Dr. Manhattan. It's yeah. Dr. Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So all of them are just human beings that are vigilantes that I think have trained and sort of like trained in this, you know, mm -hmm. kind of uh, cooperation with each other. Mm -hmm. But they're not, you know, there's no superpowers besides Manhattan. Which is another thing that yeah. Snyder kind of pushes in the film, too, because mm -hmm. in that opening fight sequence with the comedian there, he punches through a wall really right. distinctly. Right, He yeah, puts yeah, a hole true. in that wall. <laughs> and there are characters throwing each other across shot. the room. At yeah. the very end, we have Ozymandias literally catching a bullet, which earlier they sort of name dropped that as, oh, yeah, he's fast, he can catch a bullet. And you go, sorry, what? Can you rewind? No, never mind. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's roll with that one. And, like, that's, that's, that's the thing that's a little bit confusing for me, is that I was like... Are they super they, heroic or are, are, are they, like? Do they have some strength? Are they like? And I, I, I had never sort of run into a story where it's like an identity is passed on, and I thought it was kind of neat. Mm -hmm. But right. like, right. I just some of this was a little I, bit confusing for yeah. me, and I was just like, there were sometimes I'm like, man, I have no idea, and I just like, <laughs> I, I, and I somehow I feel like it's not an issue in the graphic novel. Well, it's certainly a film that assumes a lot of familiarity with the source text. And he has this kind of like, well, if you haven't read Alan Moore, go fuck yourself and go read Alan Moore. And then it'll make sense. So. <laughs> and, yet, and yet, Alan Moore like hates this. He hates mm. this friggin' movie. Well, he death. got burned quite a few times by adaptations of his work. He sat true. through V for Vendetta. He sat through The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And I think after that, his exact quote was more or less like, do we need more shitty movies in the world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. He, didn't, he didn't care for uh, V for Vendetta? He didn't. I think. No. Well, his graphic novel for that, and that's a whole separate conversation there. But mm -hmm. very, very different from mm -hmm. what the film ended up as. And yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, as you can see, I'm not uh, well versed in graphic novels, so like I, I didn't even know it was a graphic novel until like some time afterward. Um, and now I'm very clear it's on uh, more. So I just sound super educated in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um. Was yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. There's, there, there, you know, there's power in silence, my friend. Uh, sure. I, Sound of silence. <laughs> oh. oh okay. Good lord, we're oh. just going all over the place, aren't we? <laughs> um, the the storyline with Silk Spectre, I I really struggled with. Are and you I, talking? I, sorry, just yeah. to clarify, well, the yeah. original or the new Silk Spectre? The new one. Okay. The new Silk Spectre. Which is largely tied into her mother's storyline as well, because that's sort of her main character motivation, is struggling with differentiating herself from what her mother wanted her to be. Right. I, and I was just curious, so for like, what point is it Zack Snyder, and what point is it... Um, Alan Moore, yeah. Alan Moore, like, because when she leaves, you know, Dr. Manhattan and stuff like that, that scene... Oh, that was not the one that I want to smack my head against on the desk. That's a different one. I'll just bring it up for fun later. Um, but when he's, like, in three different locations and she's, like, all pissed off and whatever. Mm -hmm. First of all, I didn't get the illusion that that was, like, over, over. Especially with the idea, like, they made it very abundantly clear that he's doing something. Or, like, literally it's going to save the entire world. I feel like you could give the guy a little bit of slack if he's like, I'm sorry that I can't be here and only here with you. Well, she's trying to save yeah. the world. Yeah, I, I think I it, feel I, her performance I, comes off as a little whiny, and I don't think it's how the character should be. Do you know well, what I mean? Yeah. Well, like the the, yeah. big, the the one thing too is like with the lines, I thought it was just like you know it's a fight, and you know that's uh, you know they're a little bit upset or whatever. And I like the line where she, when um, Ozzy's like, "Don't worry, he'll, she'll come back," and he goes, "No, she won't." 
Mm-hmm. I like that because like, I was like, okay, I'm getting to the point where like basically Doctor Manhattan can almost see everything. That's cool, whatever. That's fine. That's neat. But then when she goes to Dan's place and is like, yeah, I left John. I'm like, what? Are you for real? That's how you end a marriage? Fuck that. I don't believe. Well, like that's not even. And she like, sleeps. Anyways, that. I also have another issue with her on a different section of the. the <laughs> So like I put like, on Silk Spectre Day. <laughs> yeah, I just but like I guess I'm asking you guys to sort of walk me through that. Like is is that how it happens in a graphic novel? Did Zack Snyder miss something? Was it the performance? Like what? Because like I no. feel like it's so important, and it just took a big dump on screen for me. <laughs> I think that scene is definitely supposed to be sort of like a microcosm of their relationship, and also character development for both. In that it's it's indicating how increasingly far removed John, uh, Dr. Manhattan, is becoming from humanity. Mm. And the next time that the two of them meet, they, again, have a conversation about is there value to human life? Mm. Does human life or even the Earth's existence matter on a cosmic level? Mm. He's busy on Mars building little crystal castles and saying, oh, well, (laughs) why would you care about human lives or even humanity? It's Mm. all of your petty little concerns are very insubstantial compared to this. So you can certainly understand him although he's supposed to be an unemotive character, mm. bouncing back in a very similar way and going, fine, you're going to pick a fight with me? I don't care about humans. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, think, I think what would have made I, I the... Under, di- sorry, yeah. like, I, I, just to sort of reinforce what I was saying, like, I, I understand that section of it, Yeah. but like, even with the writing, I didn't even get the impression that like, that was like, it, you know, she right. was basically saying, it's over. It's like, well, I don't want to be that responsibility, so you need to shape up or ship out kind of thing. Yeah, I yeah. just... Was that is that just me, or did did you guys get the I impression? Think, I think I think it does frame it as a very sudden moment. When I think Kevin is right, it's sort of a gradual. It's a microcosm of like what's probably been happening in the last couple of years, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, um, but you know, for for me, <laughs> if if you have someone who's constantly saying like, eh, I don't really give a shit about anyone else. I'm just doing this because. Uh, I have the power to, and I feel like I might make a difference. I probably won't. Yeah, I probably wouldn't want to date that person for very long. It would probably be kind of difficult. Um, I you think talking about Night Owl now? Or? Yeah, oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> no, but like, if you're with someone like Do- Dr. Manhattan, and I, I think that's an emotionally draining place to be. The problem yeah. is that she reacts to it in a way that sort of seems like she's only just realized this now. You know what I mean? Like, she's had it for a few months like living with this blue dude and he's naked all the time and floating around Honey, and, could you all the nightlight, please? <laughs> and all of a sudden she's just like uh this is weird right <laughs> you right so well, it, and as a character too she's her main character arc is is her sort of struggling to conform to and eventually defying everyone else's expectations she is only in the the hero business, so to speak, in the first place because her mother really strongly pushes her to be there. And then there's that scene later on after Dr. Manhattan leaves Earth where she's being really vigorously grilled by the U.S. government. And they're essentially equating her being his wife to being a government agent whose job is to guarantee national security. And that one guy, that one operative in particular, gets really upset and says, it was your job to keep him calm and now he's gone. Mm. And she goes, I'm sorry, I thought I was just married to a guy and we had a disagreement. Mm. Right. So you can certainly understand her feeling that that push pull of what yeah. is genuine and what yeah. is very orchestrated in her life. Uh, I'll take the oh man, again. <laughs> that speaks volumes. I, yeah. um, I see the the frustration that you have with Silk Spectre. I didn't have as much. I mostly just felt like the performance is a little weak. But yeah. I think the scenes that she's in, for the most part, she doesn't really drag too much away from like. I'd say her most significant work in the film is uh, with Dr. Manhattan and that stuff on Mars I think is like stunning like visually and also thematically I think it's beautiful. You that was the high. You know what's great? Yeah. That was another part that I was going to bring up that I struggle with just a little bit. Oh. Yeah. That was my favorite moment of the film was that I, whole sequence both I visually and I love the whole Mars thing. Yeah. yeah. The I I thought it was interesting. They brought some really neat points and they caught like, you know, what is human life worth on a cosmic level, all this stuff. That's very that's all interesting. It's when she finds out that the comedian is her father. Well, mm. it's the fact that he says I don't remember if he says it in the graphic novel, but he shouldn't say it. Because if you don't know like it's not a kid's movie, if you don't know what's happening. Mm. 
it's pretty clear. And when he says it, you're almost thinking like it's either condescending or thank you, Basil Exposition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just it feels like it's too on the nose. Like at that moment, it becomes that plot turn becomes too okay. It's, too uh, I'm like okay, cool. Be, the comedians, yeah. her her yeah. um, father, that's yeah. fine. It's the fact that she goes, what? No! I'm <laughs> like, oh my well, there's a, there's a God. Well, there's implications to that, yeah. too, because she knows that the comedian sexually assaulted her mother, so... I just... It's a pretty heavy pretty thing bad. to do. I, it's pretty bad. Maybe the terms I'm being of... completely insensitive, but, like... And there's a very real possible that I am. But it's... <laughs> it's, it's the fact that, like... I just... And I think maybe it's just, like, the sort of the performer um, enjoyer person inside of me, but it's just, like... The fact that like, she goes on her knees and starts pounding on things and stuff like that, and she like, starts crying, it just, for me, my brain, and maybe I'm just too dumb, but I don't understand sort of all the narrative ramifications right away. Mm-hmm. Well, what's so interesting with... about what's interesting about her sort of mm-hmm. admittedly very very emotive reaction there is that that's ultimately what cues John, Doctor Manhattan, to his epiphany of turning air into gold and he says wow human life is really worth a lot because it's this phenomenal um assembling of order from chaos where you can have two gametes and they go through this incredible process and even in a narrative sense there's these two characters who why should they ever couple voluntarily and then nonetheless here you are you're living breathing proof of that and so he he himself kind of structures that moment and the very paradoxical emotional ramifications therein and turns it into sort of a an ordered like the this is bear, what will plastic bag in the air kind of thing. Exactly. Know? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's and I, I, moment. I, yeah. I get that and that's cool and it's great. It's just like those moments where she just like I just it doesn't and I, I guess just like that does that happen in a graphic novel? Because I even I don't think it's just her performance. And like maybe if it was like somebody else and they gave just the right note on that kind of thing then sure i would buy that scene but like even those actual moments of like the character going on the knees and stuff like i it just seems like a very quick sudden holy crap no like like, there's a lot of bound everywhere yeah when i feel like you need a moment or two to be like holy shit so that means this 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 holy shit Mm -hmm. right and it's just i guess maybe it's just how i am inherently um, when it comes to stories and stuff like that, but like those, I feel like bigger moments don't work if you're smaller ones. Well, I, th- I think the point of the film don't. in general is is um, is to humanize all of these characters, to take like general archetypes and make them into real people. Mm-hmm. And I think it all it does that with almost all of them, except for I would say Silk Spectre. Mm-hmm. And I I got to tell you, um, I don't remember. Ozymandias is much from the novel, but I don't remember him being as flat, one-note, sneery villain as I think he is in this movie. Yeah, and the I only, wanted to talk about Ozymandias. Too. And the only intonation that he's anything remotely complex is that one line where he says, like, I actually weep for all of these people who have died when he's watching the screens. Mm-hmm. But even then, I'm like, nah, I, no. <laughs> no really? I don't think so. You're Be just kind of an asshole. The interesting departure in the film, and I actually read this in an interview with Matthew Good, where he was talking yeah. about his character, was he actually drew drew up his own backstory for Adrian Veidt that wasn't necessarily in the graphic novel. And you'll notice, too, there are certain scenes where he sneaks in a really, really subtle German accent, and that's supposed to be whenever he's not presenting as Adrian Veidt, but he's oh. talking to the other Watchmen. Yeah, because that so, was bugging me, too, the whole accent. Yeah, why is your accent so inconsistent? I was like, English? German? Yeah. No, uh, just, hillbilly? I wasn't sure what he's going for. Look, I'm going to save the world. Yes. <laughs> no, but his thing was supposed to be, his his own self-generated backstory was that Veidt was supposed to be essentially like a Nazi prodigy child who oh. evolved into this. He oh, yeah. grew up with that sort of ubermensch thing looming in his perception, and that's why he gets this obsession with the pharaohs of old and with deities, and he himself... Oh starts to assume that mantle of I am the Superman, it is my responsibility to save the world. So it's like a Doctor Strange love sort of thing. Where exactly. like the arm keeps going up and it's like, yeah. well, I'm trying to help, but really, you know, see, and that's the problem. The performance just comes off as like, 
very dickish. <laughs> and that's, I feel like, where they have a real missed opportunity because, first of all, it's a murder mystery. You're trying right. to be like, who did it? And then you'll take one look at this guy and you hear, like, the overbearing strings or whatever, and you're like, that one. <laughs> that one did it. And I had read the graphic novel, and even when I was like, if I had not seen this before... Mm-hmm. And Paul, I know you didn't pick up on this, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah. like, I just, this film is not good for my intelligence. Apparently, no, it's just no, like no. I'm a complete idiot. No, but no. I think a big part of it too is I was, I was less. I don't know. I just I was more interested in the backstories of all these characters instead of why were they looking for this person more than who it was. Mm-hmm. And so like I didn't really spend a whole lot of brain power. I was like, they'll tell me eventually. I don't particularly care. Right. Um, <laughs> That's a great. Yeah. Right. And like, I, I don't mean, yeah. So, and like, the thing is, is I, I found Oz Mendez more interesting in those two or three minutes where he's basically giving his, uh, his justification for his actions in mm-hmm. those three minutes than I felt of that like 40 minutes I had with Silk Spectre and Night Owl. Like I just did not. Paul's on Team Ozzy Mandius here. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just... no. And I don't, I don't know if I necessarily condone like melting fifteen million people, but I just, <laughs> I found, I found his, his story and his, I found him much more humanized for me or something I can find interesting than the other two. I just, and maybe I'm just, I'm like when I was watching, I was just too sort of um, performance based. Um, I sometimes get like that, but. Um, I don't know. Yeah, and something we mentioned earlier was that there there is certainly um, I just lost my train of thought. There's this idea Did that you? yeah, <laughs> where did it go? <laughs> but th- there's this disjuncture between very emotive responses to crises and very logical responses to them. Mm-hmm. And Ozymandias, along with Doctor Manhattan, is the only one who's orchestrating at a larger level. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the other superheroes, and in fact, a lot of the what what the film draws issue with with the concept of the superhero is the idea that they basically band-aid conflicts they if there's a gang flare-up they go and they beat them down very right, silently right. ozymandias is the one who's getting to the root of the problem and saying we can suppress all the gang warfare we want there will still be this nuclear feud with the soviets that we need to address so he gets right to the head of the problem there so he is kind of thinking at a macro level if you will which is interesting because that's there's, the there's same. That, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, well, there's that great line, um, and I can't remember if it's Silk or it's uh, Night Owl, but uh, when, um, when they're about to leave uh, his lair, uh, they say, you know, you haven't saved humanity, you've, you've deformed it. Hmm. Um, yes. And, and it, it leaves the question, you know, does, uh, does humanity survive well when a catastrophic event like this happens, and does it really rebuild, or is it now just have another obstacle to really evolving and becoming greater you know is it how much can we play god before you know everything blows up in our own face right so what i think that leads really interestingly into the end of the film because we have this the newspaper editor in the last sequence of the film when they they find rorschach or they're they're about to find rorschach's journal there where he's speaking to the state of the world and he sounds pretty pissed off about it. And he says, oh, everyone's this hippy-dippy, holding hands, singing songs. Yeah. But yeah. there is this, that ties into the film. One of the themes that coasts throughout the film is the idea that humans are innately savage and right. will continue to have conflict, will have violent altercations, and that's not necessarily something that we can correct. So there's that very interesting idea at the end of the film where Veidt has his utopian vision of global harmony, at least temporarily, right. but it's not sitting well with anybody. Well, another thing, too, yeah. is like, you talked about superheroes band-aid things. He just basically made a really big, really expensive band-aid. Right. <laughs> like, if you think about it. No, that's a good point, yeah. So, I... <laughs> I'm probably just an idiot, but for a very brief moment in time, I couldn't tell where that base was, and I was like, Wait a second, is his whole plan just like to go and either A, kill everybody else on the planet and then like leave these people like the most kind, 
gentle people and just like remake the world or are they on like some <laughs> fucking planet <laughs> and, like yeah, yeah. do they find a new planet or whatever well this is the moon is inhabitable or habitable or something <laughs> yeah well this, this is the idiot Paul watching this is the yeah. other interesting thing is that in the novel mm. um the ending is i i so it's a little different from the film in terms of plot but it's basically the same that ozymandias wants to like i uh, attack a major city and leave a lot of devastation and that will somehow bind people together. But the way that he does it isn't like in the film where he gets Manhattan to sort of like, you know, baits him and then gets him to take a weapon. He transports a squid, a giant squid from nowhere. Oh, that's I'm really sorry we don't have visuals. I brought my stuffed squid on purpose. We're going to take a picture of that and and that (laughs) may be what you'll see at this this moment. But um, that's amazing, by the way. Um, But... Yeah, he says a giant squid into the middle of New York, and that's how a bunch of people, like, die and get messed up. And they just think it's a random event and not Dr. Manhattan that did Well, he's this. scapegoating aliens as opposed to right. Dr. Right. Manhattan, which is and, why I think that, new, that the new ending actually works fairly well, is it kind uh, of ties yeah. everything together by saying, we're again, we're getting right back to the issue of we have this superhero figure who has almost divine powers and... Right. Of course, everyone's going to be afraid that he'll turn on them to the point where when he does, no one's surprised by it. Mm. This is the man who could disarm a country full of nuclear warheads if he wanted, and everyone goes, oh, yes, of course, he has betrayed humanity. Right. And it's, and it's, 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 it's that safe knowledge that, you know, there was nothing they could have done, and we just got to band together and, and, you know, fight this weird evil guy that we'll never see, rather than face the fact that maybe we're, they're all just internally damaged and messed up. <laughs> Yeah. So it's a giant squid. Yeah. A giant squid. Yeah, it's a giant so alien squid. You're, you're fixated on that, aren't you? What the fuck? Right? See, this is and, like, and like I it works. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it makes sense. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's powerful. But if you had seen it in the movie, I think probably without would've... context building up to it, because in the graphic novel they go all out and Vite hires like a comic book artist to draw visual like storyboards essentially of the most yeah. like terrifying alien visions and <sighs> I think in a in a rushed film, it would have been a little bit silly and taken you taken you out of it a bit. <laughs> yeah, no, because I really like the idea of like Doctor Manhattan yeah. being everything. Because like, like, what what do you do to a guy that has the power to just stop everyone? Mm. You make people afraid of him, or or whatever. Like you you manipulate that grand power into right. make him decide the best choice of action is to not do anything, right? Like that's I thought it was really clever. And if that's the writers doing that, then good job. I thought that was. I was almost positive that was inherent in the story. So that's and it's very fitting, too, because earlier in the film, they, they twist history quite a few times, but one of the more noteworthy ones is when they have Dr. Manhattan single-handedly win the Vietnam War in the favor of the States. Mm-hmm. And they even have a little cutaway line where they go, can you imagine if we lost? That would have oh, been yeah, 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 crazy. And everyone goes, ah, ha, 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 I get it. <laughs> but it's also kind of, again, ties it up with a neat little bow by having Dr. Manhattan inadvertently solve this brewing World War III mm-hmm. that was looming in 1985 in, in this right. film, too. Right. All right, so we've been talking about Watchmen for about thirty-nine minutes or so. Um, well, just think... well, just one quick thing to okay. wrap this all up because I think this actually brings us back to where we started. Hmm. Is that when I think Snyder commits to the letter of the text, it and even when he changes something, like the way that 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 ending is changed, actually reinforces what was there and it just simplifies it. It doesn't. Yeah. convolute it or point something or it actually the simple thing is there's no squid anymore it's just a giant weapon yeah. and all of humanity is united and it just feels like there's less funny business going on so sure. when he does that stuff it does pay off it's when he tries to sort of remain aloof with the content or satisfy fans satisfy the newcomers it just it gets messy i think that's it's- Definitely uneven, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And what I was thinking before is that Snyder's a phenomenal visual director, and he's he's very slavishly adept at replicating a lot of the wonderful imagery from the comics and translating it in a fundamentally cinematic way. But it's sometimes he, I feel like he can't quite dig his teeth into all of the depth that's going on underneath. So you get these fantastic visual sequences. And again, as you mentioned, when you add the soundtrack to them, you get these moments of movie magic, but they don't add all, all add up to a fully satisfying whole necessarily. 
Can you guys hear that? There's a truck in the background. Anyways, oh. moving on. Uh, the the thing that it does go right into the thing I want to talk about. Um, part of the reason why we decided to uh, review this film is that Kevin is uh, rather... Uh, he likes superhero movies. <laughs> can say that. Uh, you, guys can't see, you guys can't see right now, but he has um, two. I can see two superhero posters. I'm going to imagine most of those action figures are superhero oh, yeah. relative. They yeah. are. There's. I. I could take you on a tour. But... <laughs> um, um, please, please take us on an oral tour of the. <laughs> so, yeah. that's one reason why we did Watchmen. But the other second one that might be more. Um, important not important but more uh timely, timely there you sure go, to the uh people who are listening is that batman v superman is coming out in march 24th in batman v superman is it v dawn of justice oh jeez <laughs> Um, it is V, Batman V Superman. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, uh, I'm, I'm reading the title verbatim. And okay. uh, it's directed, as you would guess, by Zack Snyder. Nailed it's it. coming out uh, since the time that we recorded this about, uh, like, new math, uh, about 17 days from now, um, give or take. But my question to you guys is watching this film, seeing the trailer, and knowing some of his other works. What kind of hope do you have for this film? Because <laughs> let me remind you that this is... A, I, I'm pretty sure this is the film that has the highest budget ever recorded for a Hollywood film. I'm pretty what, sure... What, what, Watchmen? No, Batman vs. Superman. Batman oh, Superman. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, Justice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kevin likes saying the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, they've done Justice because that's their big stinger for the Justice League coming up. Good Lord. Um, but, like, it's it's it's... It's something like three hundred million dollars. It's pretty. It's pretty bloated budget wise. But you were pointing out earlier, Paul, that it's also the follow up to Man of Steel, which wasn't the most popular superhero adaptation of late. I'm one of the few who actually, and I wasn't a Superman fan before. I actually enjoyed Man of Steel. All right, get out. Uh, <laughs> whoops! Cut from the Big back. mistake. No. Hi <laughs> guys, we're doing this now. No, Kevin's not here. No, he's kidding. No, he's kidding. Keep going. It's definitely as a Superman film. It's the most somber, melodramatic, and hugely destructive take we've ever seen and very very I think following on a lot of interesting thematic light motifs of Watchmen and I think Batman v Superman does carry on this idea of who is right who is wrong what superhero do we need as a culture as a world do we need any do we need the Batman version who's a little bit more grotesque and vigilante do we need the Superman who's more the Dr. Manhattan figure um, do we need either of them necessarily mm -hmm. So there's, there's familiar ground for him to grapple. I, my on-the-record take is that it will be similar in that it will look great, but leave you wanting content-wise. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, yeah. I would like to take this for a brief moment. I'm going to take this in a, in a very sort of Paul manner, uh, a very sort of like based in like story structure kind of way. Oh, you do you, Paul. <laughs> you do <laughs> you. We don't know Batman as they know it, uh, in terms of uh, the sort of Justice League version of Batman. Mm. Okay, Batfleck. Batfleck. I I'll go on <laughs> yes. record saying I actually think Ben Affleck is a good actor, and I love his direct. Well, I love most of his directing. Okay. Um. So you know, I'm not a hater of everything. Argo, fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. No, I like Ben Affleck too. Right? But so I don't have a problem with that. But okay, we don't know Batman. And we don't know Lex Luthor a whole lot. And in the trailer, if you haven't seen the trailer, just plug your ears for a brief moment. But we, I don't know what it is, but we see some crazy thing that's like fighting them. I don't need you guys to explain what it is, but I know that Are you they're... spoiling that? Because I know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> don't, you don't need to explain it. But this is, this is how I see it. Don't and why I don't think this film is going to be good at all. I like other, in, in, a, in a story structure way. It's... They show something that obviously has to be in the third act that bans Superman, Batman, and oh, surprise, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Yeah. In it all in the third act. Yeah. Okay. So you had to. You're telling me that you had to create a full story, which right. Christopher Nolan spent an entire trilogy making of right. a Batman that you care about. Right. In the first act, and somehow you have to make you care about Lex Luthor, Superman, and Batman fighting each other, and actually have them show their ideologies and make it 
actually compelling and deep to that point in the second act. And somewhere in between the second and third act, they actually have to fight and beat up each other and make it all exciting and have the actual content that most people want to see. And then in the third act, somehow could we get Wonder Woman in it and then actually get them to fight this big fucking thing and make me care about it? Fuck you! No way! It's two and a half hours. Have you can't you... do that. Have you seen uh, Spider-Man 3? I was just going to say that's the Spider-Man I rest my case. That is, <laughs> that is my biggest fear I, is that Spider-Man when I look at this. <laughs> yeah, when, when I look at this, like, I and I was someone who liked the Avengers, but mm-hmm. so far the Avengers is the only, only movie mm-hmm. that has attacked the idea of multiple superheroes or villains or whatever it may be mm-hmm. and come away fairly unscathed because if you look I at spider-man like 3 man. if you look at like I, tons of other superhero movies that have done this it just doesn't work because the focus is like who cares let's get a bunch of cgi characters bashing each other to shit and it's just the other thing is when you see the trailer for man of steel i i i was in rapture right because oh, it's I just totally very stoked. it's this very silent like terrence malicky sort of uh, examination of like a kid and a cape, and they you think like it's gonna go Lord of the Rings in right. a really moving way. Yeah, yeah, no, no. You think it's gonna be like a spiritual experience, and then it just becomes like nothing. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the problem is that Snyder is a very good visual stylist, um, and I think that Watchmen is great source material. But I hope that the script is good at all, because mm-hmm. if it's not, I think we're in serious trouble. Well, I think thing... I don't think Snyder is the kind of director that elevates a script. I think he takes good material and brings something interesting to it. But if it's bad material, like Man of Seal, then he just it, it just becomes dour and self indulgent and, and I um, just, I, I, navel gazing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I just do not have faith that they can do all that stuff. Yes. And do it justice, like and like and justice, and, like the <laughs> Justice League. Uh, so, this so is bad. That's why some words. But I just, I don't believe that they can do that. And then, so what they're going to end up devolving into is using a bunch of tropes or yeah. like silly one-liners or, and then it's like, you know what? Cause, and like, I saw the trailer, the, the newest one with like the, the fighting for Batman and stuff. I'm like, that's cool. That's great. And if I didn't see all the other trailers, I didn't have hope for this, but they've, they've crammed, they could spend so much time. They could spend an entire film on just literally, and they only have to call it Batman versus Superman. They could spend them, uh, do a movie with Batman. Okay, great. And they have a full movie where they actually fight and do shit and whatever. But they're going to try and do that in like one act. That's not I possible. Do, <laughs> I do think this is one of the, and I'm a huge Marvel nerd myself, but I think this is one of the biggest problems with a lot of contemporary franchises is they're all trying to do the Marvel Universe building mm-hmm. model, which can be hugely destructive to an individual narrative because you spend so much time planting yes. little teasers for later film yeah. that they forget that there's a film going on right now. I completely agree. I think that's the problem with most of the Marvel films is that they are only set up for more. And and the problem is that only the, I think only the Captain America uh, films so far have have had like an individualized structure. And otherwise, they're all episodes they're they're episodic and they're like tv shows but then they're really long and have tune in next week yeah <laughs> yeah but you can't i just feel like cinema is not the right place man. for that i will say on the record that yeah. i'm more excited for jesse eisenberg than any other aspect of this movie true <laughs> Very true. Lex Luthor has always been a fabulously campy villain, and people like Kevin Spacey and Dean Ackman have really had fun with how silly they can make him. I, 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 I warping the social network into something that's kind of playful but also sinister. I'm in. I'm so in. I, I really like Jesse Eisenberg too. Like, I just think he's, I think he's just a weird. He's like the weirdest guy to break into because he's not even like Michael Cera, who's like shy and charming. Like, he's there's something about him that's very sinister. And yeah. yet, and that he's completely harmless. He's got that human brow and the slanty eyes. He looks really creepy and <laughs> foreboding. And yeah, yet, but... also, he's done all these roles like Zombieland, where he's so disarming that he brings both to the table at once. He could either yeah. kill you or charm you at the same time. Or kill you as he's charming you. Yeah, exactly. kill so, you charming. tricking me, yeah. but I feel so. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I hope he's good, but we'll see about the rest of it. 
We'll see about the rest of it. All right. Anyways, I think uh, we got everything that we need out of... At least I know that I got most of what I needed to out of my system. I was waiting for the last five minutes, and I was just freaking out. <laughs> um, other than that... Still uh, thing to squid through your head, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I God. Actually, ha- I'm, I'm like 90% sure I have that book right behind me in my little cupboard. Um, so I should probably read that. Guys, go oh. read go read Watchmen if you haven't read it. Please. It, as good as the film may or may not be, the graphic novel is automatically better. Except for the ending. Except my, for the my, 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 my opinion. But. That's interesting. Uh, other than that, uh, thanks for watching our old school audio, video, audio. So you're really podcast. listening to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks so like, for listening. Yeah, th- thanks, thanks for watching whatever I've put on screen and listening to our voices. Uh, other than that, thanks guys. And uh, again... This is Sec Perspective. I'm Paul Weston. I'm Mitchell Allen. I'm Kevin Hatch. All right, take care, guys. Bye.